Welcome to Agri Extra at Nambo Virtual. Today we are having a discussion with uh, Tabin Kosi, who is the chairperson of the Mintiro Foundation. This is a foundation established by Coca-Cola Bottlers South Africa to develop further the agricultural uh, industry in South Africa. Tabi, welcome to this session. Thank you for me. I am particularly interested in the fact that this is a foundation coming from a multinational company, mm. which is invested in South Africa, actually not only in South Africa, in the whole continent, mm. Coca-Cola, a very big brand, which has taken an initiative to play a role in the agri space. How has that come about? So it initially came about as a result of the Competition Commission's merger conditions. So there was a time a few years ago when a number of the bottlers in South Africa were merging and the Competition Commission had set a condition that they had to establish a fund to establish the emerging pharma sector, for particularly for inputs into their own value chains for apple ties, etc. So since then, Coca-Cola has basically decided to take the stance that we would like to extend this initiative far beyond the competition condition merger conditions. We wanted to create an evergreen fund that would be a formidable player in the funding space in this country. So yeah. those are the origins and it's been quite a long journey since then. But let's talk about what has happened since mm. then. I mean, actually on the ground, what have you mm. been able to achieve? So we set aside 400 million rands that we wanted to deploy over a period of five years. So yeah. far we have committed 315 million rands. Um, we funded 26 um, emerging farmers and small enterprises in the food mm. value chain. Through that commitment, we've been able to create over 1,100 jobs across the country. So, you know, we, it's, it's still early days for us, but we're quite proud of the kind of impact that we've been able to make, especially given the very innovative funding techniques that we chose to employ in the foundation. Yeah, 315 million, you yes. say. Yes. What was the criteria to qualify to access that amount? So initially, you had to be a farmer that produced something that could feed into CCBSA's value chain. So primarily, let's say, apples or sugar. But once we embarked on this, we, we saw the impact that we're making and we actually expanded this to cover all emerging farmers in all subsectors, as well as all micro and small enterprises that played any role in the food value chain. So all you have to be is just meet those criteria. Um, we have a serious bias towards women and youth owned enterprises. We also have a very particular focus on previously disadvantaged individuals. So if I want to buy a stake in an existing agribusiness, mm -hmm. would you fund me? If you are an operator, if you're willing to get your hands dirty and go to the ground and do the work, absolutely. What we are very serious about is funding people that actually do the farming work. We want people who are full-time employed in the business, who undertake that kind of activity as their primary economic activity, who basically have their blood, sweat and tears in the work that we fund. And those are the kind of people that we fund. We're very, I think, careful of funding kind of Santon farmers where people are not necessarily committed to the business. Are you saying I'm a Santon farmer? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. So you don't want to fund passive investors who buy equity in a private agricultural venture. You want people to actually operate. Absolutely. I mean, the kind of, let me just give you the kind of demographic that we find. It's, it's normally family owned farms or so families that have been on the land for a while and are now looking to, say, venture into higher value crops. Or it's a community that has community owned land and they're trying to figure out what to do with it. Yeah. Or it's a, it's a young woman who has inherited a piece of land from their parents and they're trying to figure out what to do here. They have some ideas, but just require a backer to get them going. So those yeah. are the kind of people that we funded so far. Does it matter whether the land is communal or privately owned? Or no, leased? no, actually it doesn't. So, you know, what, we, what we're very clear about in the beginning is that we weren't going to constrain ourselves from that point of view because we know that in this country, communal land is a big issue and the funding that flows towards communal land has been quite lacking in the past. So we wanted to be able to come up with instruments that would assist people even with those type of farming arrangements. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, Tabi, you have been in, involved in this sector for a while yeah. and you uh, worked at AFCRI as an economist. I don't know what else you did there. And at some point you, you worked at the PIC, at the Public uh, Investment Corporation. Mm. And uh, I think now you are associated with some private fund which is invo involved in agriculture. Mm. Now, what in your view are the differences in all these funding structures available in agriculture? And, and 
what can be done? I mean, if you look at all of these different uh, mm. available structures to actually empower the sector. Yeah. So I, I, I have a little bit of a criticism, I think, for funders in the sector. I think our methods have been quite archaic and have been borrowed from other sectors without um, a whole lot of amendment that makes them suitable for the agricultural sector, especially for, for, new, for newcomers and emerging farmers in the sector. For instance, you know, we're still looking at models where the collateral requirements are quite prohibitive for smaller farmers that want to enter the field. Yeah. Um, we're still looking at financiers that, you know, largely constrain the balance sheets of, of, of their clients to the point where they can't grow beyond, you know, that debt that they initially give them. Mm. So what we do at Mintiro, in fact, is that we apply, say, quasi-equity instruments that allow the balance sheet to have some breathing room. So we mm. see ourselves almost as a catalyst. So we don't necessarily tie you down with having this big debt burden to pay. So we say we're with you, we will support you on the equity front that allows you to raise further funding and that takes all our money much, much further. And I think those are the kind of innovative instruments that we need to start employing in the sector. The other thing is that we have this aversion against, you know, um, early stage ventures, especially yeah. in agriculture. Um, so what we find is that people who are new in the sector who have very novel ways of farming often struggle to raise funding mm -hmm. because in other sectors this would be seen as almost venture capital but yeah. that's almost a foreign thing in agriculture and we have no ways to start taking that pre-commercialization risk as financiers that allow people to really come up with fresh ideas in the sector. So yeah, that would be a bit of criticism. There. So, so, you're, so you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't support the way the commercial banks or even uh, development finance institution like the land bank does it? I think there's a role to play for everyone. So it's, it's, it can't be a one size fits all. I think, you know, certain products are suitable for certain types of clients. So the commercial banks have a niche. It's worked for a number of years. It works very well in the commercial farming space. Yeah. But what I have seen is that those very same products are very hard to translate when you get to the emerging farmer sector, where collateral becomes an issue, where um, production history becomes a problem, where things like insurance become unaffordable. Those are areas where commercial banks don't necessarily have the capacity or the risk appetite to play. Mm, mm, yeah. mm. I, I'm not sure whether you, you know where the, uh, the name the name comes from, Mentiro. Basically what it says is that our, our work speak for themselves. Yeah, so we yeah. are, you know, we want the kind of impact that we have on the ground to speak for itself. We don't want to do a whole lot of talking. We want the impact to be very clear. So yeah. that's largely what so we So now let, uh, let's talk about that. I mean, can you demonstrate that the work you've done so far can speak for itself? Absolutely. I mean, we have so many projects that we are quite proud of. So. One of the key focus areas in the beginning um, when we started the foundation was on the sugar industry. As you're aware, you know, KZN and the sugar industry has faced quite a lot of challenges as a result of the drought and a number of market issues that have battered small scale sugar farmers quite hard. Yeah. And so we wanted to specifically target that area. And that's what we did. And there are quite a number of success stories where people were able to replant with no other financiers on board. We have a number of communities. There's a community in KZN of you know, elderly ladies that has decided to, to branch out into macadamia nut farming you know, off their sugar, their sugar cane plantation. And that was funded through the work that we do. Yeah. So you know, for us, that's always very encouraging. But why did you start with sugar? Because sugar is a critical input into CCBSA's value chain. So not only for apple tizer, but also for Coca-Cola products. So sugar is a very, very important product in the soft drink industry. And we thought that it's important that we align ourselves to one of our key input industries. Mm. But there's a lot of politics around sugar. I mean, at the moment around uh, mm. taxes as well as uh, uh, imports. Yeah. Um, the, the Sugar Association will tell you that uh, we allow too much imports. Mm and which make our locally produced products finding it very difficult to survive. People are surviving on thin margins, mm. I am told. And then of course these sugar taxes are also posing a threat. What, what, do, you have, do you have a view on those? So I think, you know, the politics are there, but what we choose to focus on are the people that are impacted by the politics. So you get the politics going on here on the policy front, on the trade front in terms of SARS, and then you get the small farmers mm. that have to now live with this every day and live with the implications of the decisions that are made at the policy level. And that's who we choose to support. Yeah. So while we do participate in broader forums, especially because the sugar tax is a huge impact on CCBSA's business, mm. as Mintiro, our focus is on you know, the guys on the ground that have to really navigate this 
very complex space. Yeah. When it comes to the sugar tax, I think, you know, the debate is still raging. Um, CCBSA has definitely adapted its business model to try and, you know, use less sugar in its products, etc. But mm. I think it's still, the sugar challenge is still unfolding and it's, it's got a long way to go. So what is the relationship between Mentiro, um, Coca-Cola bottlers, mm. South Africa, and the sugar processors like your tomat yeah. and the uh, and and the uh, RCL. Yeah. So let me start with the relationship between Coca-Cola Bottlers and Mintiro. So Coca-Cola Bottlers is a founder of Mintiro Foundation. Yeah. So they basically provided the seed capital, the initial 400 million rands. Yeah. They are a backer of the foundation, although the foundation is independently run with, the, with, with its own investment committee, its own independent board of trustees. So the decisions that we make within Mintiro are for the benefit of beneficiaries and for the foundation itself. Yeah. So that's those two. Then between CCBSA and I guess the sugar providers, it's purely a customer um, supplier type of relationship. Um, you know, we're just, CCBSA is just an, an offtaker of sugar like any other user of sugar in the industry. Mm. And we just procure it from those, from those large So suppliers. you don't create certain advantages for the farmers that you support with the, with, with the other yeah. players like your RCL and your, tong your Tongat? So the sugar industry is extremely complex. So you have the growers, the millers, and ultimately the customers. And the growers supply directly to the millers. And that's where the South African Sugar Association and the Cane Growers yeah. Association feeds in. So that relationship is very tightly managed through the Sugar Act. And so, you know, it works quite well and worked that way for a number of decades. Mm. What our ultimate aim was for Mintiro in supporting these kind of enterprises was that they ultimately are able to reach the scale and the consistency of supply to be formidable and to be able yeah. to be um, you know, sizable growers within the growing program of those large growers. So at mm. this point, you find that it's a community here. One season there's sugar, the next season there isn't, and then the next season the quality is not what it should be. And mm. we think that through consistent support and through you know, consistent funding, they will be able to get to a point where they are solid suppliers and they are able to be counted meaningfully there. So in addition to the funding, what else do you do to ensure that they get the good qualities right? Yeah, so a hard lesson that we've learned is that initially we actually thought that money was enough. So we would deploy the funding and then we'd say, well, great, it's been deployed. Yeah. But what we've learned is that that's not enough. Um, we've really had to tighten our post-investment support where we've noticed that, you know, while people are good farmers, sometimes they're not able to adapt with either changing mm. technologies or different production methods. So we've had to really deploy our agriculture specialists to some communities, to some farmers to help them. So there's a big element of handholding that we do as a foundation. Mm. The other thing is, you know, we also fund entrepreneurs that are venturing into innovative spaces in the food in the you know in the food sector and what we found is that with these guys they're very very good at the idea but things like business management accounting mm. um, you know governance challenges just plague the business and really really stop it from getting to its full potential so we've had to really look at what the mm. needs of businesses are and go beyond our role as a funder yeah I, I understand I mean you would uh, naturally have gotten involved too, too much in the sugar cane space because of your vested interest mm. in procuring sugar uh, for your beverages but what what's your next biggest uh, concentration in terms of the in the mm. agri space after sugar so after sugar we're really going after high value crops so permanent agriculture so things like apples citrus um, you know macadamia nuts and very high value you know short cycle mm. crops like blueberries etc and we're doing this quite deliberately. We've noticed that there are really high upfront investment costs for these type of crops. Mm -hmm. And so what we found is that young black, you know, emerging farmers have really struggled to get into these sectors, largely because of the very, very high upfront costs that are associated. Yeah. They also require a financier that can deploy patient capital. So basically allow you five years to let the trees mature before you can sell. And so we've seen that this is a big gap in the market. Mm -hmm. And so really the next phase of our funding is very specifically targeting areas where we know funding has been a challenge. And that includes the high value crops. Do you really find people in that space who are willing to bid their time for more than five years before they yield, get anything? Absolutely. I mean, I, mean, I, would, I would imagine that's very difficult for an emerging small start farmer starting up and they are told, yeah. listen, you must just plant and wait for five years. Well, 
unfortunately, you know, that's the growing cycle of most of these high, you know, high value crops. So, I mean, an orange, you need to wait for at least three years before you see anything. For an avo, it's about a four year wait. Yeah. So generally... So how do you support them in that, in that period? Exactly. So there, you know, you're basically deploying equity funding into that. So you're yeah. saying to, to the business that we are with you for the long term for at least another 10 years. We are willing to be patient with you. But we also help them to try and, you know, you know supplement their income in the, in the short term. So for instance, some farmers would have livestock operations in addition to the permanent agriculture um, operation. So give them some short term. Exactly. Yeah. Or they would have any other ways of making money. But essentially what they need to know is that they have a financier who is patient, who is not going to come knocking at year five mm. looking for their repayment. Mm. And so that's what you need in that space. Yeah. And uh, in your uh, experience, I mean, we spoke earlier about how you have been involved in different uh, different financing institutions around agri agri agriculture in mm. South Africa. What do you think are the things that you think were missing in, in this thing? There's a whole debate about transformation every year. Actually, it's a perennial thing, mm. but we don't seem to be getting anywhere. Uh, people, Some people are frustrated and, and I don't think this sector is transforming. They still think it's still largely white, uh, mm. uh, dominated by the big commercial guys that are very established. What's you in your experience? What, what do you think are the lessons of what we can get from what you have been exposed to to fast track transformation? Sure, that's a tough one. That's a really, really tough one. I think you're being too harsh. Well, I think that we have made a lot of progress. <laughs> I've been active in the sector for over a decade, and I can tell you it's it's a completely different sector. I mean, the type of the way that we produce is world class. The type of things that you see on the farm is you think you're in a Hollywood movie. So we've definitely made a lot of strides. Yeah. What I've seen politicians try to do to address the transformation issue, which is try to bring in a whole lot of emerging farmers and create thousands of these micro enterprises. Yeah. While it is, I think, encouraging to see people on the land, we're not creating commercial grade farmers. Yeah. And I think the focus has been on keeping farmers perpetually emerging and I think that is a big that is a big concern for me so yeah. what I'd like to see is us focusing on a very very small group of high potential farmers and rather than going for quantity go for the quality and really aim to make these big macro and big enterprises that we see you know in, in the more established agricultural circles so wow. I don't quite support the very very small subsistence farming model where government is supporting people annually you know keeping them small yeah, but those are like more like survivalist type of enterprises. They are, and I find that it's you know they are romanticized. So you know we've seen debates in the, in the <coughs> political space about you know bringing back the land, about people wanting to be back on the land, and I think there's a very romantic type of notion about that type of livelihood and you working the soil, etc. But at the end of the day, it's about creating creating sustainable livelihoods, creating incomes where people can support their families, where people can go to school, where there can be mm. generational wealth that is built. So we really need to balance the the notion of like this, you know, going back to the soil with really creating proper commercial enterprises that can support development. Well, I would imagine that has to do with maybe uh, linkages to markets. Because if people mm. realize that they're having access to markets, it is an incentive to produce more at a particular quality and quantity. It's, it's that. It's access to markets, which is a big issue. But it's also the issue of scale. There, you know, there's this notion, there's this concept in agriculture of an economic unit where you know, below a certain threshold, you just can't make money. It becomes it's unviable. Yeah. Exactly. And so we have a lot of farmers that are operating just below that viable economic unit threshold. Mm. So essentially what we need is to scale up or find ways of aggregating produce to create the kind of scale that you need to access serious markets. Because yeah. if you are a big retailer of a big food processor, the transaction costs of dealing with a whole lot of small farmers are just not worth it. You might as well yeah. just go to the bigger. Yeah. So we need to create ways of lowering those costs and creating the scale that we need. Yeah, but do you think policymakers understand all of that? I think they do, but it's a really, really complex space. I mean, I've had the, the fortune or the misfortune, I don't know, of, of you know being involved in some of yeah. these discussions. And there's a lot of competing interests. 
and you know you almost you want to take the rational approach but there are all sorts of human dynamics at play as well and i think i don't envy the policy makers i think it's very clearly understood it's been in the literature for years yeah. but sometimes economic fundamentals are not supported by human issues or complexities generally but i mean what, what are the stumbling blocks one would think that we should all share the same a view about the future. We, wa we all want a stable future. We all want a competitive economy, which basically means all the different sectors of the economy, yeah. inclusive of agriculture, must be competitive. Yes. And the people operating in that space must be competitive, which is your, it boils down to the, 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 the farmer, you know, the farm manager, and all these managers, and all the different people. Mm. So sh sh why, why is there a difficulty? It's difficult because, and I repeat, I mean, it's it's really about the complex. Let's, let's for instance, look at the National Development Plan. So yeah. the National Development Plan highlights a few subsectors that we are going to focus on as a country to create jobs. These are fast growing sectors. Yeah. But if you look at those kind of sectors, it includes things like citrus or blueberries, etc. Yeah. But those are very, at the same time, they're water intensive. Mm. We are a water scarce country. So you have now that interest. So do we now grow the economy at the expense of our natural resources yeah. or do we, so these, that's just an example of you know, some of those competing interests when we say it's not really that simple. So we know what needs to be done, but we have these natural constraints as well. Yeah. Another issue has to do with communal land, mm. where we think as economists, just keep, give people free title and you know, let them be able to mortgage that land and then and they, that money. can just be that asset. And, but at the end of the day, those systems have persisted for hundreds of years and there's a wisdom there. Mm. So there's this thing about you, know, you want to have this land into generations, you want to be able to pasture together. And so those are the kind of issues that might not make sense for us as commercial players, but are very real and yeah. add complexity. Yeah, but so in your in your experience at Mintiro, I'm sure you come across, I mean, some people own the land privately and some people are working in the communal space. Yeah. Does it make any difference for you? I mean, like based on your experience? It does. So you get community schemes and you get community schemes. Some are very, very well managed where the governance structures are very clear. There are clear leaders. The lines of communication are clear. There's accountability within that structure. And those are the kind of communities we like to work with. Yeah. And you get others where there's a lot of conflict. Uh, there's a lot of power plays in there that make it very difficult for an external financier to come in. Yeah. So it makes a very, very big difference what the management of the community structure looks like. Mm. So it doesn't mean that private land is superior to communal land because yeah. you could still have all sorts of feuds within private structures. Mm. But really it boils down to is there control, is there order, is there clarity in terms of who does what, who owns what, you know, who's responsible for what. And that's all we look for. Yeah. So the issue really is just access to land, regardless of what type of land, in terms of whether it's communally owned or privately owned land, for as long as there's good governance structures. Exactly. As long as it's good governance structures, as long as that land has the potential to do what you think you can do with it, then I think that's, you know, that should be something that all financiers need to be open to. And we've seen you know, people trying to bring innovative models like permissions to occupy, um, getting long-term leases from communities. So I think financiers are starting to wake up to the reality that we have all this communal land. We can't lock it out as financiers. There's a lot that can be done with it. There's money that needs to flow there and everyone can win in the long term. Yeah. So your kitty has run dry now, has it? It hasn't run dry. So we have decided, well, we're fully deployed and now we're really doing follow on investments on our existing beneficiaries. And we okay. thought that that's actually a very good decision that we took given what has happened with COVID-19. Yeah. So what we saw is that, you know, a lot of our beneficiaries didn't perform as we had envisaged, much like any other business in this economy, During and they require period, yeah. additional support. So had we really overextended ourselves, we would have found ourselves and our beneficiaries in a very difficult position. So at this point, we are very determined to make the successes, to make successes of the projects that we already fund, to mm. take those to new heights and to, you know, provide whatever follow on support that they require. And that's largely what we're doing. Mm. But we have started the process of raising a second fund um, under Mindiro that we will then start to deploy once we have concluded that, that fundraising process. Do you expect all the capital for the new round to come from your original source, which is uh, 
Coca-Cola uh, Portless SA? Not all of it. I think we will be looking at a whole lot of partners for the second round. We have proven that we can do this. Mm. We have applied methods that have not been tried in the, in the sector and they have worked. Mm. And we've you know, paid the school fees that we've had to pay. And now we felt we feel that we've really proven ourselves as financiers. And we've had a lot of encouraging discussions with people that would like to partner with us and join this bandwagon. So I think the second round will be a lot broader. Yeah. We will be a lot more, I think, aggressive in terms of targeting specific areas that I spoke about earlier. Yeah. And we're hoping that it will be a little bit bigger so that we can stretch that a lot further. Yeah. For, just for informative, for information purposes, how mm -hmm. does your structure work? I mean, if somebody is watching now and is thinking, I hear all these nice, this lady is talking about all these nice things about funding capital, but I have no clue. How do I access this thing? I mean, how does your structure yeah. work? I mean, if somebody somewhere is interested yeah. in finding out. So, you know, when we were open for funding, we basically had a broad call for applicants. It was yeah. all over the media, it was on the website, it was on social media, and you could really just apply with a business plan, with your projections, and a number of other different criteria that we required in there. Yeah. And you just submit your, your application um, through the online portal. It would then be sifted through by the investment team that is, made, that is managed by our executive manager, Nidiro. Mm. It would then flow through to the investment committee that has an independent chairperson that would really put that transaction through its paces, get back to you with a few questions, etc. Mm. Ultimately, it would flow to the board of trustees who would then approve that funding. Yeah. So when is the new process going to start? As soon as we raise the funding. It's fundraising, if you've ever been through that process, is a nightmare. We are no exception. The market is exceptionally But your difficult. original uh, funders should put the initial capital. How much are they going to put? Well, <laughs> you're really putting me in a corner here. <laughs> I think, you know, the COVID-19 has a big, has added a lot of uncertainty. So while we're hoping that we will still be able to get the same magnitude of support as we originally had, we really can't say at this point. I think CCBSA has said that it's quite interested in carrying this on. Yeah. But the magnitude at this point is quite unclear. And we'd still also need to go back to our other funders and see where their appetites are, given, yeah. you know, this uncertainty of the past few months. But one thing for sure, you're not going to stop the, pro the, the, the project. We can't stop because we have commit, we've made commitments to our beneficiaries to be with them over the next 10, 15 years. So we can't stop. You know, yeah. we have taken equity in these businesses. We've said that we want to partner with them. So whether we raise a fund too or not, that support will still continue. We've made provision to keep supporting our existing beneficiaries all the way until our commitments run out. So, yeah. you know, we're not going to just leave anyone in the lurch simply because, you know, we don't raise a second fund or we change the way that we do things. Yeah. Well, that brings us to the end of our session. And thanks for Antipo for joining us. And uh, good luck for the second round of raising money. And uh, all the best to your beneficiaries. Thank you very and much. And thank you for joining us in this session at uh, Agri Extra at Nampo Virtual. Until next time, goodbye.